welcome uh, donors of Extinction Rebellion. Um, to the, this, is a, this is a first ever uh, donor debrief call. Um, I, I'm Margaret Klein-Solomon. I'm the interim fundraising director for Extinction Rebellion. I'm also the director of an organization called the Climate Mobilization. You can see in my back, uh, in the back of my screen here, those are my two like loves, um, the Climate Mobilization and Extinction Rebellion. Um, and so I've been, I've been work do, uh, helping Extinction Rebellion with their crowdfunding. And um, as you may, as you guys may or may not know, that's raised almost a hundred thousand um, pounds. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a lot of money. And so this call is to um, say thank you to the donors who made that possible and to um, give you all some kind of an inside look at what Extinction Rebellion is doing and how it got to be um, what it is. And uh, yeah, and, and potentially uh, kind of grow into um, I, I, you know, a, a larger and more regular, I, I would like, like kind of donor engagement, you know, hopefully this will be the first kind of call like this and we'll have more. And, um, so anyway, um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be, uh, to be here and to be, um, connecting you all, the donors, uh, who, uh, helped make this, uh, you know, big crowdfunding success possible with um, Roger and Gail, uh, who are the, some of the founders and kind of core uh, organizers and visionaries of uh, Extinction Rebellion. And um, so, so I have, so, uh, I have a, a bunch of questions for Roger and Gail that I'm gonna ask them kind of in an interview format. I expect you all on the line have some questions yourself, which you can put in the chat. Um, and I'll, I've got I've got some questions, and then we'll uh, move into donor questions uh, towards the uh, second half of the call. Um, but you can you can feel free to add them now. But we'll get to them in in at that point. Um, so yeah, so if we could kick off, uh, Gail and Roger, <laughs> could you uh, just introduce yourself and um, yeah check in. Yeah, so hi, so I'm Gail uh, Bradbrook and live in Stroud in Gloucestershire and I'm from Yorkshire. Hello. Hi, Gail. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Roger? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, my name's Roger Hallam. I'm um, a de research at King's College in London on radical and progressive political change, how to make it effective. Uh, I've got a background in social movement organizing. Uh, I've got an organic farm in Wales, which is where I'm at at the moment, which is very nice. Get away from London. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very much everyone for coming. Uh, so yeah, so Roger and, and Gil, you know, you guys, you guys are so modest and the, the culture of XR is in general, it's so like egoless, but so I'm going to just add to their self introductions that they, you know, they, they, uh, have built this organization rising up that has then taken on the XR campaign which has really kind of shaken up the, I mean, the, the global climate movement. Um, I would say. Um, so, 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 yeah, uh, Gail and Roger, could you could you tell us about that? Could you tell us about creating Rising Up and kind of how that got started? Sure. So, um, Rising Up was formed in two thousand and sixteen. Uh, Roger and I uh, didn't know each other. I think we'd met each other vaguely on some network from the New Economics Foundation, and we were both uh, more sort of radical <laughs> on there, I suppose. <clears throat> we were both trying out different methodologies. Uh, Roger was doing something uh, at University College in London to do with uh, rent strikes and using a process called conditional commitment. And I'd actually built a platform for conditional commitment, which is like, I'll do something uh, if you'll do it as well. Uh, so I'd started something called Compassionate Revolution. 
and uh, <clears throat> Roger was going around meeting radical groups and I was going around trying to get something off the ground and, and to cut a bit of a long story short there, we, we met up in April 2016 uh, and started having meetings with other people to say, you know, we need a strategy in this area, what, do, what we're not winning, <laughs> things are getting worse, uh, what do we need to do? And so we went through a period of consultation, talking to different groups like Earth First, Plain Stupid, Reclaim the Power, uh, people from Occupy, Democracy, and so on. Um, just whoever had listened to us, I think. Um, various meetings and started writing a strategy document uh, to launch something in November 2016. So it was a back off the back of some aviation campaign and by a group called Reclaim the Power. Um, and um, I'll sp sort of speak for myself here, but I think one of the things you do when you're trying lots of things is you fail often. I've read that about social entrepreneurs. So you, you try things out and often they don't work. So the first thing we tried was supposed to have 100 people arrested at Heathrow Airport. I think there were 13 or 15 or something. <clears throat> but it was, um, it, it, it was the starting point. We followed it up in the February with another action at Heathrow Airport which showed us that this fear that can be in activism around repeat arrests was not something that necessarily had to be so uh, worried about when you had the moral um, force behind you, I guess, when you, when, when you were essentially correct about what you were saying. Um, and because Rising Up was set under, up under holocratic principles, we did some of the basics like getting databases together and websites and branding and all that kind of stuff. But we, uh, between us as a group, as people joined us, um, different things were tried. So um, there was actions in London around uh, pay and inequality called um, Life uh, Not Money at the London School of Economics that Roger led. I was doing stuff around toxic banking and fracking. Um, we did things with Land Justice Network, with Disabled People Against Cuts. <clears throat> we tried lots of different things to test out tactics and in that way I guess we built a team and between us the team built some trust and we met relatively regularly in gatherings and meetings and uh, um, Roger tabled the idea for Extinction Rebellion, it wasn't called that then but you know the basic idea of it in January this year. Can I, sorry, can I, can I get a clarification? Uh, so when you were starting out, you were l doing these actions to learn and to test out tactics because there was already the idea of a bigger campaign? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, but, but both of us uh, know that, you know, all of these things are interconnected. Um, I mean, without getting into our own personal political views and spiritual views, but things are interconnected and... Um, uh, so which, which tactics work and how do you do things like momentum driven organizing? We uh, had some training around that from Carlos Saavedra in the States at the Aini Institute. Um, I, I mean, in, in saying that we were testing things out, we, the, the things that we all care about deeply. Uh, but I think one of the things is that when you watch a lot of front lines open up, so in Stroud in Gloucestershire, there's an incinerator that they're building, which is mental. Um, the, the, the fracking sites have been expanding in the UK and they've been um, subject to uh, legal um, mechanisms to keep activists away, injunctions and so on. Uh, Heathrow Airport got given the go ahead and, 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 you know, it goes on and on. What, what you're doing is watching all these front lines open up in both social and economic and environmental justice and knowing from uh, you know all through this time uh, all of us were reading many books and I you know I do say that like as a movement at the heart of it there's essentially some nerds that really <laughs> like yes data. yeah we really like data we, we like reading stuff um, getting training thinking about things um, but it's also important to build trust with each other, isn't it? You know, we're quite maverick between us and, um, and, 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 and understand what our strengths and weaknesses are and how we work as a group and so on. So, so yeah, that's, that, that, that was the process. But the idea was always that um, the system has to change. You know, the system is killing us. There are six people in the world that have the same wealth as the bottom 50% of the world. It, it just by by most people's measures it's it's madness and it has to change and whether you 
uh, spend a lot of time thinking about homelessness or the environment or disabled people's rights or, or poverty or whatever it is, um, you know that there's some fundamental structural issues that have got to go. And so our, the, the question, I guess, that united Roger and I from the start was, how do you get a social movement that's effective? You know, what, what worked in the past and, and what can we bring in that's different this time? And, and from, the, from the very beginning, that uh, there was an awareness of the e climate and ecological crisis as kind of core problems, core crises or something? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess, uh, um, you know, taking this back to that January meeting, maybe Roger will talk more about that process of getting Extinction Rebellion off the ground. But, um, you, you know, some of us, including myself, were saying, well, you know, climate change is a symptom of a bigger toxic system. And uh, Gene Sharp says you should work on the pillars of the system, you know, look at the toxic media, the toxic uh, finance system that we have, um, to the fact that the democracy is essentially fake. Uh, these days and um, Roger was saying yeah but you know we've got to really get our head around this climate change business um, so uh, you know just putting forward different proposals and different ideas in meetings about um, you know how to make the big shift. Awesome. Um, Roger is there anything you want to add to that about the yeah the kind of genesis and early stages of rising up? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I just want to emphasize that this is a sort of research driven process. It hasn't, it's not, uh, it's not a matter of chance. I don't think that we've been so successful. I think we've been working on this systematically for two or three years, shifting through the literature and asking some fundamental questions about how progressives and radicals organize and how they define their strategies. And we've come up with a whole bunch of innovations, which I think together have pushed us towards this tipping point and the success that we've had. So I don't think it's altogether unexpected, though obviously it's very welcome. And I think we decided, or at least I argued in January, that the climate crisis and the wider ecological crisis is in a way a, the trigger point of 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 what's going to create the crisis which is going to bring about structural change because all these things that gail have said is interconnected but it seems like the extremity and the gravity of the uh climate catastrophe which is evidently in process now um is the thing that might and probably has brought people out on the streets with a determination to make some fundamental changes. So I think it's a combination of those two things, a sort of existential dread, terror, as you might say, of what's happening, which is deeply emotional and ultimately spiritual process, and also a hard-headed look at why progressive movements have failed over the last 30 years to really impact on the, project, you know, the trajectories of of inequality and inequality of power and corruption in the world. Awesome. Could you could you say more about that, or just you, so so uh, rising up did this research and came up with some important <laughs> innovations um, and and has avoided the problems that have hampered progressive movements. To tell tell me more about that. Well, I can summarize a few of them. I mean, I'm, this isn't necessarily exhaustive. But I think from an organization point of view, um, one of the major innovations is to have a holocratic structure, which means that we've moved on from large scale consensus, consensus based organizing where you have to have a lot of people involved in a lot of decisions. I was a consensus trainer for 10 years, so I'm fully into the notion of consensus, but it evidently doesn't work and hasn't worked when it comes to large scale organizing. And, and that doesn't mean we need to go back to an old sort of top down hierarchical structure. I think what has been innovative, particularly in the States actually, is, is uh, distributed organizing or holocracy, where you have some basic aims and principles. You spend a lot of time training people in, in how to work effectively, and then you give people maximum autonomy 
in their particular groups with their mandates and their roles and responsibilities to get on with it as they have done, uh, as, as they see fit. Um, and this has been shown many times and indeed with Extinction Rebellion can facilitate what you might call an ordered rapid, a rapid mobilisation. So we're all familiar with rapid mobilisations um, in, in various historical periods, but as everyone knows, the main problem is they tend to be disordered and it's not really clear how decisions are made and they usually end in tears as it were. So this is a way of combining best of both worlds to have a rapid mobilisation which still has a structure which is participatory and has some accountable means of making decisions. I mean obviously in reality you know it's quite messy as everything is in reality but there's a fundamental change there I think. Uh, and then secondly as far as the strategy is concerned I think the big move has been towards recognising that mass participation, civil disobedience is historically the most effective way to bring about structural change when you're facing a sort of entrenched power situation. So again, everyone's sort of familiar with the civil rights movement in the United States, where a similar sort of change happened in 1957, I think, when Martin Luther King said, we've done 70 years of trying to persuade the authorities to give black people rights and what have you and we're going to change the strategy and engage in disruptive and sacrificial mass action which is going to be enacted in a dignified but you know vigorous way and as everyone knows over the following 10 years there was a sea change in in the structural position uh, of black people in the, in the american south so in some ways we're facing a similar situation now that We've had 30 years of conventional NGO-led um, activism on climate change, during which time the, um, the emissions have gone up globally by 60%. So there's no way of avoiding the fact it's been a catastrophic failure. And what we're basically saying in Extinction Rebellion is, let's try something that's tried and tested. It's been happening many times in the global south, which is, as I say, mass participation, civil disobedience, which is enacted in a respectful way towards the opponent, but with sufficient vigour to bring them to the table. Let's put it like that. <laughs> and, and, and I think um, to, to add to that, what, what Roger really innovated in, when he brought his paper to us in January, and we all were like, we don't think we're ready for this um, and, and disagreeing, was um, the idea of telling the truth and asking people to act accordingly as a, to act as if that truth is real. And since then, and I think Roger, I think that was like an instinctive piece from you. I don't think you'd come across Jane Morton's work then who's a psychologist who's been saying, why is it that the green movement isn't, you know, on the whole talking in such a massive way about how bad things are and asking people to act accordingly. So, you know, you don't say like, it, you know, we're facing a massive existential threat. Oh, it's so why don't we all just like, you know, fly a little bit less and, 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 and eat less meat, which obviously are two good things to be doing, but um, it doesn't sort of stack up. Um, the, 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 you know, you, you don't say like, you're gonna die in three months time. So, so why don't you just have a, an extra day off work a week? you know it's like that, that kind of um incongruence and um so it, it turns out there have been some people thinking yeah thinking out there about what it means to tell the truth and it was it's been a really i think interesting process when you've been you know given the talks and roger's probably given most of them uh, or more of them than, than i have but um when you when you're giving the talk initially it's like a relief for some people for it to be named so strongly and um for the grief to be allowed and and to be welcomed so there's a psychological element uh, that you know another part of social change theory is that people act uh, based on emotion not based on logic and fact so acknowledging how frightening this is and how traumatized we all actually are by thinking about this and by by living in this system that's fundamentally at odds with the planet um, and asking people to act accordingly. I mean, initially my experience of that was that um, when you sort of said to people, uh, well, you know, getting arrested, I mean, it's not to say getting arrested in itself is a great thing, but, you know, being willing to be disruptive or being willing to do something uh, that shifts society that you might get
get you you might get arrested you know are you willing to do that at first a lot of people are looking at you like you've just asked them to do something really terrible and like take a shit in the room or something like that you know and um uh, but after a while it's just it's really changed across the uk the energy around that that we somehow normalize something and that was um always written down in, in rising up's kind of um uh, critical success factors to use that kind of strategic language it, that, that we needed to start normalizing civil disobedience for it not to be this weird thing that you're asking people about um i'm watching two people eat their lunch or something <laughs> i don't know how that works but yeah. yeah so so um so yeah so we've talked about uh, telling the truth about the climate crisis, and I'll just kind of pin on to that, and advocating a solution that could actually protect civilization and the natural world if implemented. Um, the, we've talked about the strategic value of uh, nonviolent, escalating nonviolent civil disobedience, and we talked about holacracy. Um, I want to ask about regenerative culture and the kind of spiritual piece, because I just, so um, when I was in London uh, spending time with you guys at uh, in the office. I, it, I, I honestly, I, I would say I've never felt, I've never fit in anywhere better. I, I felt like, I mean, all these people are so nice and welcoming and, uh, driven, you know, they're, they're like at, here to work and to get stuff done. And I mean, it's really, it's really quite an amazing, um, accomplishment to that, that cult, that culture. Um, so I'm wondering if you can speak to how, how you did that. How, how that happened we, we, we were stopping and having a disco every couple of hours as well <laughs> there we? you go yes um <laughs> i mean it's a it's a really strange time actually because on the one hand you know having wanted to do this for so long and feeling this groundswell of involvement and relief it's like having the time of your life at the same time that the grief and the shock and and and, and yet more papers are coming out so it's such a big deal so um for us uh I think if you ask any of us in Rising Up or Extinction Rebellion, we'll all have a different take on regenerative culture. And I think there are things written down about it, but it's got different layers to it. And for some of us, there is a spiritual basis to it, a sense of the sacred, but that's not kind of for everybody. And atheists are completely welcome. And, and actually, I often find atheists who are very morally focused to be some of the most spiritually minded people. Actually, it's a sort of funny thing, but um, but I suppose one of the first things is inner work, you know, like, and that was certainly for me a big part of my pathway. And I'll be speaking about it at an event in January, but uh, with the Psychedelic Society. But, um, you know, how are you sorting your own self out, you know, the places where you might be inhibited or um, anxious or whatever it is, you know, so you need to be dealing with yourself. And then um, how do we operate as a community? How do we make sure that our meetings are human? and connected and so we always start with a check-in so that if you're having a meeting you know like what you bring into that meeting you know somebody some, somebody's mum might be ill or they might have just had a really bad time or they might be feeling like really happy or whatever so just to just to ground that meeting in the fact that we're human beings so we have culture like that we also try and just be quite practical about it so um i think roger brought this rule in but um one of the things we say is don't call it don't call each other out online you know don't do that thing of going oh margaret did this you know like or gail did. because you know if if margaret and i which we don't have by the way and like a problem between us um it'd just be great if we just had a face-to-face -face or a conversation had a chat about it much more likely to 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 um find a resolution and understanding and some compassion for each other if you start doing it online and you contagious it with everybody else it it really bit brings the culture down so that's a really important thing and we actually at the start of all our meetings we remind each other not to do that and i think also so great um it, it just it does really work i mean you know and, and 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 obviously if you're in a meeting and somebody was behaving really terribly you'd have to ask them to stop in front of everybody but it's it, you know it generally um having that culture of i i call it the don't be a dick rule as well <laughs> you know um you, you know and we are all dicks at some times but you know also just having a, like a little word with each other if we're if we're out of line and, and trying to see we all do really super care about things 
Um, there's also issues there about op oppression and uh, most of us are white people at the minute, but not just, but, you know, how, 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 do, how does gender impact on these things? How does sexuality and race and class and all the rest of it um, affect how, how much um, involvement people can have in organising and, and, and dealing with that stuff? Um, and then, as a, you know, when we're on actions, um, so some people might have seen we did actions where there were lock-ons, so people in arm tubes laid in roads and so on, uh, ended up in the rain, some of them. So you would keep people as comfortable as possible, make sure they've got food and water and uh, cigarettes, if that's the thing. And, um, uh, and then after they've been arrested, uh, wanting to make sure that people are communicated with and feel supported through that process. I mean, we do our best around that. I, I really, I, you probably wrote this one, Roger, but I do really love a line in one of the documents we were sharing with people before the actions, which said all this stuff that we wanted to have in place. And we also asked affinity groups to have a well-being person, things like that. But we also put a line in that said, look, we're organising a rebellion, not a school trip. You know, you can't make this perfect for everybody. And there are inherent risks in what we're doing. And you can never tell how the legal system is going to behave, how the police are going to behave, how, how stand passers by are going to behave. So doing our best to have a, a culture. And so maybe the, perhaps the last thing to say about that is one of our principles and values is no blaming and shaming. And... Um, it's, it's really common, isn't it, to go, it's their fault and if only they had changed. And um, I think it's been actually a real joy to say to people, you have power here because you could do um, either support or you could yourself undertake acts of civil disobedience. And um, so that's where the power lies. That's um, part of the um, social theory of power, that it lies in the collective, not in the corporations or the government or so. And we give them the power by not getting our shit together as a collective. So, you know, what that means for a movement is that you need to get your community together, you need to make your connections and you need to sort yourself out so that you come forwards with your power. So I think the, for me, the regenerative culture underpins part of the social theory of change. Yeah, can I, can I add to that? Please. Yeah, I think, I, I think when people are talking about social and political change, people tend to over focus on big macro sort of elements you know whether you know what what the aims are and what have you but the research i've done over the last four or five years sort of points in the direction that the little things are actually really important and, and one of the supposed little things is how people treat each other and it can't really be emphasized strong enough that being respectful towards each other and being welcoming towards people into the space you work on is a massive determinant of success or failure and I mean I think we all admit that we don't get it right all the time but I think we've put a lot of work into doing that and we've created a culture where people are expected to treat each other with respect uh, and and once you've established that culture then people tend to fall into it uh, and that's something that's quite unique I think in modern politics because there is a tendency towards towards calling out and all the rest of it and sort of aggressive moralism, as you might say. Um, and and, and I, I think I see a difference in terms of like the level to which it seems like people are motivated by like their ego or like, you know, need for gratification and acknowledgement and personal success. Yeah, it seems yeah. like people are really working as a team. Well, I think, I think there's some fundamental shift which we're trying to encourage, which is that people shouldn't be involved in activism as a sort of something that you, that, you know, you're getting from the movement, but having a more of a service orientation, yes. as, you, as we might call it. Okay. And there's a lot of evidence that people that do have a service orientation, whether that's a secular or religious orientation, tend to be a lot more psychologically sustainable and resilient because they're looking at, it, at what I can give to the process rather than what the process can give to me. And um, that's definitely the way to go. And I think people that have been coming into Extinction Rebellion are, 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 are very emotional, actually, in, in the sense that they suddenly found the community of people that has realised the extremity of the situation we're in. And, and that's... And that's created an atmosphere of, of dedicated service, I think. 
I, I, because this is a serious situation, isn't it? Beyond serious. The, the, most, uh, the most serious one could possibly uh, imagine. And I think you see that in people's eyes. And I mean, I've been involved in, I've been in social movement organizing for 35 years on and off. And I've never seen anything like it. I, I genuinely haven't. I'm not just saying that. I genuinely have not seen anything like it. People yeah. coming up to me on numerous occasions saying, I want to give up my job. This is what I want to do. And, 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 and this, is, this is highly significant, really. And, and that's why we've grown so quickly, uh, you know, and, you know because, because we've sort of opened the gates, really, to a collective desire to, to survive, really. This is, this is well visceral played. as that. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, there's no point beating around the bush. You know, this is it. <laughs> uh, and so it's not, in a way, it's not surprising. I don't think it is a surprising, but it's a massive relief for me personally. And I'm oh. sure many people on this call, we've all felt enormously isolated in, in, in thinking, what the hell is going on? Are we just going to allow this to carry on? And then suddenly it's like, suddenly everyone's coming out. It's, 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 it's almost like a religious awakening, <laughs> but yes. it sort of has some sort of existentialist religious element to it. And uh, I'm not a particularly religious person, but I can, I can sense that. And I'm not sure how to describe it, but it's something very powerful. Mm. Totally. Um, okay, so could you guys describe what the last month has been like? October 31st, George Mambio at... at Parliament <laughs> issuing the declaration and just like, whoo, taking off. So, so I'll start and Roger, Roger can uh, finish because I, I guess in a way that's part of what we, we did as a as a organising team was to tag team a bit in terms of energy. So I was quite heavily involved in getting the launch together on the thirty first. Um, we had more people there than we uh, planned uh, originally. I mean, we could tell it was going to be bigger as we were building towards it, and I think the George Monbio article really helped that. And um, I will share something that, you know, with my uh, spiritual practice, and, and it and it's just always feels a little bit odd because I do have a background in science, but I do pray and uh, ask for support. And my experience has been in this last month that things have gone better than planned. Um, and there's lots that can go wrong because uh, when you're in Parliament Square and I was part of Occupy Democracy there, there's lots and lots of rules. You're not supposed to have amplification. You're not supposed to have uh, protests that haven't been somehow approved or... Uh, there's just lots of ways it can get rid of you basically and um, so you could have turned up to parliament on the 31st and the whole thing be fenced off um, so it was just a beautiful sunny day and uh, we, all the speeches happened and we had to do the human microphone to, to ensure that Greta's voice was heard and we'd, we planned to do that anyway for the declaration and you could just feel this energy building um, and obviously we had a bit of a, a a bit of a plan that somebody might get on the road and that we felt there had to be some kind of symbolic civil disobedience. Um, but I, I, I was at, at the time, I just thought the whole lot can just walk to the road and, and get in it. That's clear, you know, and so rapidly just trying to make sure the rest of the team were, were okay with me initiating that. And, um, uh, you know, just ask people if they were ready to rebel and, and invited them to walk to the road slowly. And, and, and so that happened and we had a democratic process in the road. So that really, if I'm honest, wasn't a plan. Uh, not in that way. I mean, I sort of picture that might happen, but uh, that, was, that was really um, exciting. Obviously, some people were willing to get arrested, but I'm pretty sure none of them have been charged. Um, so uh, I think that then... That was a great launch and then we had sort of 12 days to, to the start of the week of actions and what we were testing there really were the affinity groups. So we've been uh, going around the UK um, and supporting other people to give the talk about um, the Extinction Rebellion and 65 affinity groups have, fo have formed as a result of that. But it, it, it's quite a different thing, you know, telling people about what the theory of change is to getting them to come to London for a week and actually participate and have accommodation ready and know who the, you know, these people are coming. So um, we, we didn't have 65 affinity groups joining us at, uh, at, for the week of action, but we had some and people will have seen that we did a, an event at the Department for Business, Energy, Innovation and Skills around fracking. Um, that was another one. It wasn't planned to, to, to climb on a roof and do a bit of extra spray chalking, but we did what you'd call a mini escalation at the time. And there's something really about being quite mischievous that, that, that 
is 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 okay you know anyway but uh, you you got you got up on the the top there uh, with allegedly the yeah, allegedly I mean we're still investigating but someone um, someone with a someone with a striking resemblance to Gail <laughs> was so, up on the, the top ledge of the Department of Energy spray painting and with a bullhorn it was I've just I've just fessed up in really all these something. people that glued themselves to the building but I didn't actually really fancy the glue so I was just sort of faking it so I could nip <laughs> off and have a wee and stuff like that you know I was sort of wandering off and then pretending to glue myself back on again it was a bit funny but um and it was getting a bit wet so we we moved people around from the rain and so I mean it's quite a thing at the time you're trying to work out what's for the best to do uh, with people to, to, to you know there, there were a lot of press there um, and there is a bit of a game there where you're creating you know that part what you've got to do is create the story I mean I love that moment recently where Roger was on Russia Today and they're like what's the point of doing all this what does that achieve and he goes yeah it gets you on Russia Today <laughs> you know it's sort of like really obvious point that the press don't come out when you're stood there with a placard you know so um there was actions at the Brazilian embassy we had a queer party and it's terrible what's happening in Brazil right now and uh also outside DEFRA and outside the Houses of Parliament uh, there was a little bit of a focus on food shortages uh, so it was kind of, I guess, it ended up being a bit of a build up to Rebellion Day One, uh, which was the big day that we had planned, um, where we had, it, it turned out, we think around 6,000 people came uh, to block the five bridges and we'd uh, taken advice in advance about um, the implications for emergency services so uh, we did communicate with the police. We didn't get their permission or anything like that that seems to be circulating. But we, what we did was to let them know, because if you give them a couple of days notice, they can plan alternative routes and so on. Um, and again, those bridges went phenomenally well. Uh, some funny stories from that Lambeth Bridge seemed to be the main one for getting arrested. So Westminster Bridge, where I was, we were kind of sending people over. Uh, and at some point, it just had to stop because the police couldn't arrest any more people unless they I, I think they just run out of coppers and vans for doing the arrests and um uh so so that so that went really well and and i guess when we were originally planning this we thought there might be a repeat arrests and people ending up in jail on remand so that's why the talk focuses quite a bit on the possibility of jail time it became more clear that it was going to be people coming at different times and that the energy of the 12th may lead to extra energy. So, um, uh, so, th so while we were running the first week, plans were being made around swarming. So maybe Roger wants to talk about that and Rebellion Day 2. Um, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to say it's probably like it's been probably the happiest four weeks of my life <laughs> there's a few moments that compete with it but um yeah i was just uh, on a bit of a flow really and i just loved working with a team of people in the office i i, I i've i've spent quite a lot of my life sort of building fast growing ethical businesses so it felt a little bit like that sort of atmosphere of constant growth uh, and i felt quite competent to deal with that because I've had experience of it before and a lot of the stuff you don't see on the front line you know um, a, a lot of the reasons why things are successful because you know the office and the organization is working properly so that's what I wanted to focus upon um, I saw a, a real highlight I think a historic highlight I think was 6,000 people involved in civil disobedience on these bridges I think that's the first time that's happened in an organized way in the UK for you know, arguably several decades. So I think that sort of put a marker in, marker down really of what, of how radical political change is going to happen in the Western world, you know, through mass participation, civil disobedience, which is organized uh, and, um, and disciplined, as you might say. So, uh, and as people may know, yeah, we, we had several hundred people uh, blocking the roads around London later in that week for three days, or something called swarming, which again hasn't been done in an organised way. Uh, it was done in a particular design to allow traffic through and, and not to do a continuous block. But, and obviously a lot of people were very upset about it, but a key sort of understanding of what 
needs to happen in order for radical social change to happen in an emergency is people do need to get upset because through emotion people change they don't change through information so uh, and um, those pictures of the swarming went around the world and I think it's had a massive effect on uh, on people talking about the climate change sort of crisis for the first time in many ways um, yeah so and then we've had and then on the Saturday we had what you might call a finishing ceremony for this iteration of the rebellion uh, which was a funeral march to Buckingham Palace with a speech that Gail read out to the Queen even though she's a Republican <laughs> but uh, yeah so um, yeah so I feel like yeah the four weeks really created a bit of a debate in, in the UK at least and certainly around the world on, on what the hell's going on I think that's what we've been trying to say what the hell's going on you know do we want to carry on on this path or don't we and um, and in some ways that's a little bit like lacks concreteness and some people criticize us for not having specific aims but i think drawing back to the civil rights movement in the states and various other examples one of the main things you have to do to bring about political change is get people talking about what sort of society they want to live in you know asking these big moral questions about the health of a society and the nation and i think we've got to do that and you do that through this disruptive activity uh and yeah, so now we're basically reorganising ourselves and as, as we'll say in the next bit of the talk, I think, we'll, we're, we're looking at um, bringing on a lot more people and a lot more organisation. And, and maybe to, to say a little bit more about the, the, the goals, because I can see Jacob, or however you say your name, Jake, to, asking about concrete demands, because um, Roger picked up on that slightly then. Uh, we, we, we mentioned in the talk some really concrete things that governments can do, uh, carbon budgeting, rapid transition to renewable energies, uh, changes to the transport system. And there, there is a lot of literature out there that, 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 that can happen. There's some really cool stuff you can do, changing the agricultural systems to capture carbon and so on. But we've been really clear uh, not to, d to say what the blueprint is for the change. There are people out there that have had a go in the past, like Zero Carbon Britain. And the reason why we've decided to do that, I mean, there's, I think there's quite a few different reasons, but as Roger said, you've got, it, it's supposed to be a democratic process. So the changes are so sweeping and so massive that for us to say it's this, this and this gives us too much power. And also I think it just gives an ability to focus on nitpicking about those demands and 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 whatever which whichever one you pick to mention i've noticed that if i mention regenerative agriculture that you know charles eisenstein bigs up and it sounds really great but uh people who've more got more of a vegan orientation in some cases think it's about animal agriculture and aren't so happy with it uh carbon taxes some people really celebrate and other people don't like and so on so i think the idea is for that debate to take place within a citizens assembly rather than to take place while the movement's growing the political power because the whole idea is to get the political power and then be able to have the conversation but i think to to reassure first of all there are interim demands in the sense that we do say the government when they tell the truth has to stop doing things that are inconsistent with that truth so you know, a third runway at Heathrow and fracking and, and, and quite a few other things that they've been doing and cancelling and so on. There's a shopping list there already of things that we could do in, in, in the interim. Uh, but to make the massive, massive change, um, that, 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 that there are ideas out there, but, but it, has to be a, it has to be a process that involves the people. So, okay, so just looking at the time, um, I want to make sure to get to, um, I'll, I'm going to put all, all of my, the rest of my questions into one big question and then take questions from the audience. And my big question is, okay, so, uh, you know, we, part of, as all of this incredibly exciting stuff on the ground was happening and it was getting in the media and it was getting on social media, this is just big, big, big. And as part of that, uh, we raised like a hundred thousand pounds or, 70,000 pounds um, it, during that month. And what is, uh, you know, and from the people on this call, again, thank you. Um, and so what is Extinction Rebellion going to do with that money? And like, and, and 
just yet. Yeah, where do we go from here? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it is being spent. I mean, it's quite uh, expensive running a social movement. We did need to get an office in London. It's temporary and I think we're keeping it on till the end of the month and probably going to find another one. These things are all up for discussion and being looked at at the minute. Um, we just literally had to have a place to gather the media team and people who were coming and going and getting materials together for the actions and so on. And it had to be central. So, um, I mean, that was, I think that probably added up to about £5,000. I can't remember. Um, we also have something, uh, we've been calling it the compensatory budget, but we will call it the volunteer hardship budget. So we're trying to create this middle ground between um, the idea of an NGO where you have staff and salaries and the problems that come with that where it's about somebody's career and it's about they're worried about whether they're going to pay for their mortgage or not and so they're more bothered about the money than the movement um, and the idea that you can run something on volunteer energy uh, which obviously you know I, I personally I work as a consultant for NGOs so I do fundraising and strategies and all, and all that type of project management type of stuff and I get a day rate for it I just haven't been able to um, do that work this month at all uh, I just couldn't have found the energy or the time for it so uh, just being transparent about it from this process that we've created internally uh, I asked for £750 for my time in London which is you know something I could earn in a couple of days to be honest doing what I do but not 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 the 60 hour days that was putting in so I hope people can see it's 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 just a waste for some of us to pay our bills and to and to be able to deal with being in in that it's, case being in London and so on it's an and, incredible bargain you are getting a real bargain, I tell you. But, it, you know, obviously it's not about that. It's just about everybody. It's, for me, the money is about everybody contributes in the way that they can. And we do obviously foreground arrest as like a part of the civil disobedience risk that you take. But um, what we understand from the Erica Chenoweth data about social change is you need about 3.4% of the population or less. So about 2 million people in active participation and one of the ways to be an active participant is to help fund the movement you know is to help fund the people that are at the heart of it and all the leaflets and um you know all the travel expenses and and, and so on that people are, are incurring so um we we've we've everything's uh, in a in a budget and written up and um i'm meeting with the finance team next week and actually what i really want us to do is just put everything online we had some money from uh, lush funding i think being as open as possible so people can see uh, where money goes is 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 the way is the way to go with this because it's just things where you know then then people can see great yeah can i add to that please yeah i mean obviously so far on this call we've been fairly self-congratulatory maybe <laughs> well deserved <laughs> however um i think we all need to gravely consider what needs to happen to actually succeed and are we not close to succeeding at the moment we've made a good start but we have to be like ruthlessly honest with ourselves that what we're looking at here is a massive change and that's not because we're ambitious because objectively that's the situation and what we're looking at is a at a minimum a structural change in government policy and at the maximum a complete transformation of the culture the social structure of society because we're in this massive emergency uh, and this isn't going to be this isn't going to be brought about by a few thousand volunteers if you see what i mean it's a major major undertaking and it needs to be organized because as i think i said earlier in in, in the session it's, it's easy enough to get 200,000 people onto the street, as you might say, but it's not all going to end in tears unless it's done in a structured, organised and disciplined way, where it's democratic and accountable um, and non-violent. And all those things require organisation. Uh, and organisation is basically you know, the hidden factor here. And organisation takes money because people cannot work full time if they don't get some compensation, it's simple as that, or at least you're not going to enable people who traditionally aren't able to work full time, you know, people that are poor or minorities and all the rest of it. So having, uh, you know, an estimate is we probably need five to 10 times more money than we've got at the moment 
in order to carry things forward in an optimal way uh, into a major international non-violent uprising event in, in April, which is what we're looking at. Um, 500,000 to a million pounds. That's what you think it would take? Yeah, I think we're looking at, I mean, I, we're in this incredible situation. I mean, I've been at the heart of the organizational center, as you might say, over the last four weeks. And literally like dozens of people are coming forward who want to work and give up the work they're doing. And some of them are fine. You know, they've got a partner who can pay for them or they're semi-retired. And other people are young and they simply can't exist in London. I mean, everyone knows London is a massively expensive city to live in unless they get two or three hundred pounds a week. You know, this isn't a lot of money, but it makes all the difference. And it's that generation which needs to lead this movement and they need money. I mean, uh, there's no two ways about that. It's just the way it is. So um, I think that's a, a major challenge. And I think we've, we've, got a, we've got a game plan here to actually do what needs to be done. You know, at the end of the day, it's mass participation in civil disobedience. We need 30 to 50,000 people on the street in varying degrees of disobedience, as you might say. Uh, and then we might be in the ballpark of meeting with the government. And, th and that's what we're looking at, right? It's not about just doing a protest and feeling good about ourselves. Those days are past. We've got to be focusing on winning. Uh, and that's going to take organisation, dedication and the finance we need. That's my take. <laughs> quite, a, quite a pitch. Really, really great. Um, I, yeah, I think... Uh, uh, yeah, I think perhaps we should take a minute and just, um, whatever, applaud Roger and Gail and the, and the broader XR, too. I mean, that, that movement has a lot of, it is a deep leadership bench, a lot of great people working in this organization. But so anyway, uh, yeah, I want to just offer them a round of applause and um, heartfelt thanks from from me and i think i think everyone else on the call as well so like yeah you have, people are muted <laughs> but, but we, do, we, we do that yeah. <laughs> anyway. um so so yeah so we're very we're close to an hour here um, i apologize i th i just i uh, i wanted to get through those questions i i think we've covered a lot of great ground and painted a pretty good picture. But do people have um, some questions for Roger and Gail? In, well, our there's, there, there's one there from Jake asking about use of Slack. So um, Jake, we use a system called Basecamp um, for people who want to um, participate more directly as an organizer. And I think we've got a serious issue at the minute, but we were working very hard to sort it out. We, I mean, this movement started with 15 of us in a room in May in Bristol, uh, planning how to go about things. And now there's at least 500 people involved in organizing this. this we're in um, 131 groups across 22 countries and so on. And so you won't know what what we're doing like none of us quite know what's going off and we we have to rapidly restructure and decentralize um and we have a lot of plans a, a, around doing that and, and 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 essentially the key thing there is that if you're interested in xr you want to find your way in quickly to the bit of the movement that makes sense for you that brings your skills forwards that brings your passion forwards in the right team and you should be feeding into decision making processes we get in um the, the, the final thing i'll say on that is that we're going to be um probably starting next weekend but i'm not quite sure exactly we're going to be getting some mass webinars led by a woman called mickey Cashtan on how to decentralize structures because it's like it's kind of like part of our brain needs to decentralize because it's very easy to think of sort of central command and control and we want to move away from that so um there's some there's some questions there coming up uh, uh, but i'll leave you to facilitate yeah um okay so i i'm i, I want to put these out and you guys can kind of answer them perhaps together in an answer okay so what are the plans for the next three months say more about the events of April and what's happening in the US. I feel like these are all kind of of a piece. Sure, yeah. And there's a bit where it says, is it 
intended to be a mass movement or more of a disruptive prelude. No, it's intended to be a mass movement. And actually the super exciting thing about the decentralization piece is the way I would say it's prefigurative for how societies could organize in a much more democratic way. So it's like a practice for the, for the, for the way that we need to structure going forward. So that's really exciting. Um, so the plans for the, next, for, the, for the next immediate weeks is to do this restructuring. Um, we're, we're taking a bit of, ad, we, and as part of that, if you're in any way involved, there'll be questionnaires coming out asking for feedback and so on. Um, so uh, there, there'll be um, other opportunities for actions, but we want to make sure that people in their own cities feel that they've got the information that they can take action. So this recently in Stroud, there was a big cycle ride and a dine at supermarkets and all the rest of us. Um, so uh, Roger, do you want to say more about the vision for April? So it's April 15th, it's a week of action. So it's in the, it's in the week rather than, you know, on weekends, although I guess we'll move into the weekend. Yeah, well, yeah, I just want to re-emphasize that um, we're in the process of um, restructuring ourselves. It sound, might sound a little bit boring, but I think you should take this as the, how seriously we take the notion of democratic accountability and, uh, and decentralization. That these things, these things can't just be created at, you know, the click of a thumb, as it were, or a finger. Uh, they, they need some thinking about and we need to get that right because as i said it's very easy to build a mass movement and it's very easy for a mass movement to fall apart so we've got to get the structures right uh, as 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 we grow so it might look like nothing much is happening but again the most important thing is actually happening at the moment which is how to absorb you know 100 200 people into an organization that used to have 20 and that, in many ways, is, can be quite painful as well. And it needs some sensitivity uh, because you need to move people around and all the rest of it. So having said that, like, it does not mean that nothing is going to be happening. It means that we're basically creating a group to look at the strategic action sort of schedule between now and April. And that'll be happening in the next seven days, I expect, as a meeting tomorrow. Uh, and I think, although... Again, this is probably my personal prediction because it's going to be a group process. But I think we're probably looking at doing a number of national and international action days between now and April to build the resilience and knowledge in the movements around the world. Because um, you can't go from zero to international uprising in one go, as you might say. So um, that's probably going to be happening it uh, might be something happening in the UK, uh, UK-wide coordinated actions by different groups uh, towards Christmas. Uh, there's an idea of having a slogan of 12, only 12 Christmases left related to the, the UN report. Um, and then uh, I think it's highly likely that there'll be international coordinated actions in January, February and March. And... We set the date of the 15th of April, basically as the start of the second iteration, as it were, from the November one, on the basis that we build on the experience of what's happened this November. And again, this hasn't been finally decided, but I would expect that we're going to go forward with that. And although it sounds very ambitious, we're looking at uh, an international uprising of nonviolent civil disobedience of thousands of people in the major capitals around the western world and maybe further afield um, and as everyone knows it has to be that ambitious because this has to be something that takes place internationally rather than just in one country um, so yeah it couldn't be more ambitious in a way but that seems to be what we need to do at this stage in world development uh, yeah. I, think, I think to say, sorry, but you jump in and I, yeah, um, in, for, for April, I mean, we, we, that was the plan for the International Rebellion and we already had loads of events on the 31st and on the 12th and on the 17th. So I think this is going to get much bigger and obviously what we need to do is have a, a group discussion about what kinds of things people want to do. It's important to, to be disruptive for lots of reasons that we've talked about. And it's, it's a really beautiful thing when, when, uh, when the civil disobedience manifests, if you like, the vision that you're really holding. So there was a moment 
on the 12th when trees were carried into Parliament Square to dig and to, to plant trees. And there was this palpable kind of, <gasps> you know, from people and the police came to sort of stop it and everybody stood up to stop them and, and the trees came in and they were dug in. And of course, they were removed a, f a few hours later or, but, and when we got them back in the office so maybe they'll get used again. But, um, but there's something about when the vision uh, of what you're doing is, is is what you're seeking to achieve is part of your disruption so for example on one of the on the bridges when we were running people's assemblies mass participatory democracies so i th i think that would be part of what i'd be advocating for as as part of the um the april uh actions um but actually it won't be up to me to decide um because uh i probably won't be in that team because we're restructuring but i'll be letting people know what i think so i hope that answers your question hilton it's nice to have you on the call um and and see samantha's asking about uh milton Keynes, and and i think that's an opportunity so thanks for getting things going in milton Keynes. that's awesome really appreciated I, I, I hope that you're woven into the base camp situation, but I put my email in the chat, Samantha, if you're not, you can mail me. Um, so you can be in touch with other local organizers and find out, find out how they've done things. Um, at the minute with the crowdfunder, we've, we've uh, said that 20% of it will put, will set aside for international uh, growth. So, so supporting that focus. Um, and I think we could do with doing similar in the UK, uh, but we haven't put that mechanism in place at the minute. And there is a need. I, I, we don't want to be centralised, but there is a need for the national focus to, to get some money at the moment. Um, so I'll be meeting with the finance team soon. We, we have talked to some funders about having a separate pot that local groups could tap into. My experience of organising locally is it costs money and I've just had to pay it and figure it out between the group so uh, just to get things going to a certain scale we did get asked by penguin to do a book um actually i'm not sure i should have said that sorry <laughs> i just did i don't know if that'll happen but if it does that kind of thing if it might be happening um maybe that kind of money would go towards um local groups i mean the the, the key point here is it shouldn't come everything shouldn't come to a center money should be flowing around the system and we just have to really keep thinking and learning about how best to do that so there's no magic answer you can certainly have access to uh, logos and probably would get uh, sent a load of leaflets and stuff like that um but it, it generally is it, it it's quite a group bonding thing to be honest samantha to get people in a room painting banners up and reusing materials for that kind of thing so so just to um summarize what i think i hear you guys saying is that um Extinction Rebellion, through this incredibly successful month of action, has reached a new uh, level of engagement and support from around the country and around the world and financial support. And it is kind of uh, yeah, absorbing that interest, restructuring, getting people into volunteer roles and, you know, comp low compensated roles. Um, and uh, and is gearing up for, um, I, I mean, I, I saw some kind of rumors on Facebook or whatever that's like, is XR slowing down or pausing or something? And it's just like, absolutely not. It is gearing up, getting stronger, getting bigger and preparing for the next stage of the rebellion. Absolutely. Although, you know, we are letting people know that some of us are having a bit of a rest, you know, that, 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 that uh, you know, that's part of the culture to have a, to have a rest. But um, there's a question there I'm noticing, Margaret, about useful to work with organisations like 350.org. I mean, some people may have, see, may have seen that we did at the start of this campaign in, in, back in early October, we did um, an occupation of Greenpeace's officers. It was very friendly. We took cake and flowers and... Um, so everybody hid the horns from Roger so he couldn't go around blowing the horns <laughs> as he wanted to because we wanted to keep it really lovely and um, uh, we are having conversations with organizations as conversation with some of the some of the big bigger online platforms even than 350.org it's always an important balance to figure out how you have a relationship with any kind of NGO so that there's not big compromises being asked for and um, watch this space on that front i think i shouldn't 
pre-announced things on here that haven't been agreed yet with everybody else. Um, but we, yeah, we are definitely talking to other organisations. I, I think it's more tricky than you think, actually, um, quite often. Yeah, I think I think this is maybe an area we've missed out on in describing what what needs to happen here. Is uh, how I how I see it is extinction rebellion is basically a catalyst which is going to transform democratic political culture in 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 the in in the Western world at least. And that sounds quite grand, but someone has to do this. And someone has to bring bring these people together uh, and shake them up and say we're in a crisis, and we we either work together and get ourselves out of it, or we're all going to go down. And whether that's through fascism or through climate, you know, climate crisis or some, you know, horrific sort of combination of the two. So this is a very serious sort of proposition that we're putting to some of the more like NGOs, which are, I think a lot of the people in the NGOs know this as well. I mean, a lot of people know what's coming. And I think this opens up a really interesting space in progressive culture in, 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 in the countries we're in. Um, for, for, for the first time for a, a generation for two or two is to basically create a united front, as it were, people working together on a common agenda. Um, and I've been personally really surprised by how open some of the people are being at Greenpeace and Avaz and various other organisations uh, to the notion that, yes, we need to have mass participation in civil disobedience and that's going to be the future and we've run out of the other options. So as far as XR is concerned, I'm very much hoping that we will be open to, to and trusting towards these organisations uh, and that will be reciprocated. And, you know, if some of these big organisations work with us, they're perfectly capable of publicising to hundreds and thousands or even millions of people the need to get involved in this sort of process. And that could lead to, you know, 50 or 100,000 people being on the street in April. Um, and that's what we need, of course. So Far Farhatna comments, uh, it would be great if everyone on the call can reach out to groups like 350 and others in their networks, which is, and, and at COP24, which is a great, I mean, that's, uh, I feel like that's very much in the spirit of Extinction Rebellion, right, is, you know, decentralize, kind of take it on yourself. Yes, absolutely, we need to be influencing these organizations. It's like, so let's do it. Let's, like, uh, everybody take part in that. Uh, pressure campaign and invitation campaign. Um, but okay, so I want to I want to um, I want to wrap this up because, as I said, I think this should be the first of many uh, like donor calls. Not necessarily all of them with Roger and Gail, though. I, I hope that you guys will come back. But I, you know, the the idea that um, donors can get a, a closer look at Extinction Rebellion. See what see up close what they're supporting, and you know hopefully decide. Uh, yeah, this is an organization that uh, is really worth um, my resources and investment. This is really you know a, a good use of my funds. Um, <coughs> so I, I hope that everybody um, uh, you know feel feels like they learned and that um, that they can make a more informed decision about. Uh, supporting uh, Extinction Rebellion. And okay, so um, why, don't, why don't Roger and Gail, if you guys wanna make uh, uh, some closing statements and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Or maybe it could be like uh, inspired perhaps by the XR system of checking out. <laughs> you going Gail? No. <laughs> Um, I, I do need to check out my um, boyfriend's mum's in hospital. My little boy's having his 13th birthday. Um, but I absolutely love talking about this stuff. I am sort of can't shut me up, as people might have noticed. So I would love to do it again and um, hope that um, there's, there's more questions and, and so on. So, yeah, let's do this again soon. Yeah, I mean, it, I'd, I'd really uh, like to give a heartfelt thanks to the people that have provided money so far and I can't I can't say how important that has been in order to provide 
provide you know financial security for the people that are going to make this big change in their lives and if there's anyone that wants to talk to me personally about any or Gail I expect as well personally uh, about a donation they may wish to give and want to have more information it's certainly a major priority for me and um, I think yeah I think if we can get the way I see it, to be honest, is if we can get these hundred people that are making major changes in their life to come to come and work. See, um, I'm I'm having I'm having trouble hearing yeah. you, Roger. Are, are, is oh, it right. you breaking up? Okay, yeah. You just suddenly went a bit dull on the queue. Oh, when did I? Your yeah, final yeah. Grand my pitch. final grown pitch. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're back okay now, so that's cool. Like, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah. State okay. surveillance and interference. Yeah, so so this is my this is what I think. I think it's the most important thing in the history of humanity. Um, oh no! And uh, for better or worse, and and uh, maybe we haven't got it all right, but you know we're first on the block on on this uh, in terms of in, international mobilisation, and uh, we need these hundred people. How I see it is, we need these hundred, two hundred people to be working flat out, and and we need the money to support them. Uh, so if anyone's out there can help with that, I can't exaggerate how important, you know, say how important that is. So thank you very much. Look forward to hearing from people. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Margaret.